Okay. Well, let's get started. So welcome everyone. And thank you so much for joining us. I am very excited to be here today with Jennifer Donville and Barry Sampson, who will talk to us and dive into a timely discussion on digital learning solutions. My name is Erica Fotheringham and I am the Gender Equality Officer here at CanWatch. Today, I have the privilege of joining you from the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit Peoples, commonly known on settler maps as Vaughan, Ontario. I would like to acknowledge the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory on which we are learning and organizing today so that we can keep aware of where we are and what the history is. We have folks joining us from across Turtle Island and from across time zones. This is a moment for us to pause and to reflect on the continual occupation of Indigenous lands, the relationships we have with the history of this land and colonialism, and how we're going to move forward. I honor their long history of welcoming many nations to this beautiful territory, and I uphold the voice and values of our host nation. Okay, so. During today's session, Barry will walk us through practical solutions for designing digital learning. You will have an opportunity to ask questions throughout this discussion. Please do populate your questions into the question and answer Zoom function. And we will be keeping an eye on that. And Jen will pop in and pull out the key questions and pose them to Barry to answer throughout his um, presentation today. So, I am so excited to introduce Jennifer Donville, who is going to kickstart our discussion today. Jennifer Donville is an absolutely brilliant gender equality consultant with us here at CanWatch, and she is going to dive into this discussion with Barry Sampson. And uh, we hope that you you learn a lot. So over to you, Jen. Ah, thanks, Erica. Um, I'm really super excited to introduce Barry um, to the group. Um, welcome to gender equality working group members and CanWatch members beyond and others. Um, this, uh, we brought together um, this group and Barry uh, sought out Barry's expertise in particular because many of us are um, transitioning face-to-face uh, -face experiences to a digital environment, a virtual environment, um, and Barry has a lot of expertise in that. So we thought um, we could all benefit from his um, expertise and experience and having a session to, to kind of get us all a little bit more familiar with some of his approaches. So I'll just introduce Barry so you're all familiar with him. I have the, the um, privilege of working with Barry on a project right now and I've already learned so much from him um, and he's got quite uh, a CV. Uh, he's worked as a people professional for 25 years, first in HR where he had roles as an HR generalist, a recruiter, a project manager before finding a home in learning and development. He was then a trainer, training manager and learning designer before moving into e-learning in 2003 before we even knew that was a thing. <laughs> As learning technology manager at B&Q, which is Europe's largest home improvement retailer, he worked on a number of award-winning e-learning and blended learning programs and championed the use of emerging tools and technologies. So um, his depth of experience is long <laughs> in the tooth, which is great. Um, since 2008, he has worked as an independent consultant, designer and developer, he collaborated with Clive Shepard, um, his colleague, to design and develop two resources for learning professionals, the more than blended learning design process, you can Google that, um, and the skills journey self-study courses. Barry now splits his time between designing and developing learning solutions for clients and providing capability training for learning professionals around the world. And although he's worked with a wide range of organizations, um, he has particularly enjoyed working on projects with NGOs, like many of us um, work for, and humanitarian organizations, including Concern Worldwide, Oxfam, Save the Children, and Plan International. This has involved designing multilingual, multicultural learning programs delivered in challenging digital environments. So I know many of you are curious about those experiences too. So without further ado, Barry, welcome, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Jen, for the wonderful introduction. The check is in the post. Um, hi everyone, thank you so much for, uh, for coming along. Um, I, I don't really need to say any more about me after that, um, that fabulous introduction. Um, but to, to link together uh, what uh, Jen has just told you on, on what we're going to be covering today, what I want to do is go through the more than blended learning design process, which is uh, say something I designed with my, um, my now retired colleague, uh, Clive Shepard, um, about... 10 years ago, so it's about sort of 15 to 10 years ago, we were sort of using this process in a kind of ad hoc way. 
And we formalized it and we've used it on a number of, um, of really big projects. And it's also been adopted by various organizations for them to use in-house. So it's kind of you know, been, been tailored for, for their own um, needs. So the whole thing that we're going to be doing today is um, it's, it's based around, um, I have to get the plug in for my colleague, Clive. Um, this is the book, More Than Blended, um, which is a fairly hefty tone um, around the, the entire design process. But we're going to do kind of a compressed version of that today. Before we get stuck into things, um, there's two things, actually three things that I wanted to cover. The first is in terms of structure. Um, I've got, there is quite a lot of content. Um, so what I've done is I've put in, a, a, I think we've got three points partway through where we'll just pause and we'll take questions. I'm also hoping that I don't talk so much that we use um, most of the time in terms of presentation. I wanna make sure we've got a reasonable chunk at the end to pick up on, on whatever questions you have. I know that your questions aren't going to necessarily directly relate to the design process, but I'm gonna kind of put money on the likelihood that we can probably answer most learning design related questions um, within the context of the process. So that's that's one big thing. Second thing is, is in terms of blend. Um, I'm talking about digital learning, I'm talking about a uh, blended design process more than blended. I just want to be clear in terms of um, how I define a blend, because we frequently see um, a blend. Um, you know, there's a, you know, an interpretation of a blend as being a little piece of e-learning, a live, you know, in-person workshop um, followed up by a quiz or some other online activity. You know, I, I suppose that could be a blend, but that's not how I consider a blend. For me, every learning design is a blend. It's a blend of the right learning strategies. It's a blend of the right social context. It's a blend of the right kind of media tools. And that's what we're gonna to cover um, today. The third thing, which I wanted to, to just cover before we go on, is just to show you a, a couple of slides. I'm gonna get you at this one point to do what you should never really do in, in these kind of things and ask you to just read what's on screen. So just wanna, have a look at this little cartoon. I'll just give you a sec to, to read these slides. Now it's in the context of Michelangelo, it does seem kind of crazy that, you know, the idea that anyone would just ask, well, if I want to be this good, what kind of chisel um, do I buy? But as Jen said, I've been working with with e-learning, with learning technology for what, 20, uh, 17, 18 years nearly. Yeah, 18 years. And the first question that people always ask is around tools. It's always whenever they look at something, it's they don't necessarily think about learning design principles. They're thinking about what is the tool you use to create something. And the big thing for me is that tools do not make great learning content. All that tools do is help you deliver content efficiently. It's all down to um, the learning design. So that's why we have the learning design process I'm going to go through um, and why we structure things the way that we do. So I want to start off with the process by introducing you to this, which we call the jukebox. Um, it's, uh, I suppose you could say it's called the jukebox because it's um, a sort of, you know, a thing you can go to in terms of getting out your um, different options of learning design, but it's mostly to do with the shape of it and my age, um, recognizing it as a jukebox. Uh, in terms of how it works, so this, the jukebox summarizes up the entire uh, learning design process that we have, starting at the top with the need, coming down through what we call the three L's, the learning, the learners and logistics, the preparation input application follow up, which is the structure. And then we have the learning strategies and the social context. And then we think about the delivery channels and the communication mode. So on the left hand side, this is where we think about how we're going to go about teaching and training something, how we're going to create, uh, you know, design our learning interactions. Over on the right hand side, where we're looking at delivery channels and communication, that's where we make choices about how we go about getting this content, getting these activities, getting these interactions to our learners. One of the, the foundations of this, um, th this whole design process and one of the things that inspired us very early on 
um, was some research that is um, the, the research paper was titled the no significant difference no significant difference phenomena which was a piece of research which was a combination of um, sort of live research and meta-analysis going back and looking at previous research and looking at the effectiveness of classroom training and the effectiveness of digital training and what it demonstrated was that as long as the social context and the learning strategy is the same there is little to no difference in terms of the actual learning outcomes which I think for a lot of people that feels like a really big surprise that um, you, you can do things digitally and get as good results as you can from face to face. And in fairness, there are probably people in the learning world um, who uh, you know, kind of feel the other way around is a surprise. But it is all about learning design. It's not about technology. It's all about really great learning design that maps onto people's needs and then goes on to make best use of technology. So we're going to start off um, at the top now. I, um, we sent out um, a video, which uh, hopefully you've all had a chance to watch. Um, if you haven't had a chance to watch it yet, um, I'm sure we can send out the link again um, after the session. I'm going to talk about the need, but I'm not going to talk about too much the learning, the learners logistics. I, I'm going to touch on them, but I'm going to do it very high level because if you haven't seen the video, um, you can kind of fill in the gap afterwards by watching the video. But I, I want to get on to the design but let's crack on by just thinking very quickly about the need. And when we're talking about the need in the more than blended process, our focus is on the goal. And when we say the goal, we're talking about business goals. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, yeah, okay, we know this, we do this, we're used to doing needs analysis, learning needs analysis, training needs analysis, however we we'll describe it. With pretty much no exception. Every organization that I work with and um, we're talking about learning design, they'll always say, oh, we don't need to cover this. We don't need to jump onto everything else. We don't need to cover the needs analysis side of thing because we can do that. We've done that for years. We're really good at this. And I will say, we say with pretty much no exceptions, it's the bit that everyone does really badly. Um, people are very good at going through a process of needs analysis or what looks like needs analysis, but often isn't really needs analysis. And one of the big problems is because they don't start from the desired outcome. So the desired organizational outcome, they start from a learning goal or a learning objective. And that's not what we're talking about at this stage in the design process. What we're clear about is what actually is it that we want to happen as a result of the learning. So what is it that this learning sets out to support? So in, um, in a very simplified environment, so if you think about things like sales, um, you know, it might well be that uh, you know, we're gonna train people on a certain process and the desired goal is that sales will increase by 20%. So that is the goal, not we're gonna train people on a process. Um, it might be that um, I, you know, I've been introduced to, to things where the goal is we're going to train people on how to use a piece of software. That's not actually the goal. The goal is what is it the organization hopes to achieve by implementing that piece of software? It's just, I don't want to bang on about it too long, but this is just so important to the design process because I see so many things that on the surface look like fabulous designs, but they have no impact because there was no clarity about the objective in the first place. So you have things that have been designed with either no goal or the wrong goal. So it's so important that we have the goal clarified. The next step is just being clear about what is it we want people to do? So you know, it's identifying the performance gap. If we want this to happen, what do we need people to do? The next question is then, well, what stops them doing it? And that gives us a cause for the performance gap. The, the important question after this is, you know, identifying, is it actually a shortfall in knowledge or skill or do they need performance support or is it something else? Because realistically, we can only address those problems that are there in the big um, dark pink box there. It's the knowledge issues, the skills issues and providing some kind of ongoing performance support. What we can't do as learning designers is 
train people to fix a problem that is actually caused by something else like organizational structures or lack of budget or lack of time or anything else. So we just need to be really clear about whether or not we can solve the problem or whether there are parts of the problem that we can solve with learning and there are other things that need to happen as well. So I'm gonna very quickly go through the three L's. So learning, um, we split learning up into knowledge, skills, big ideas. This is probably very familiar to all of you that have got learning experience, or you may see this presented as knowledge, skills, and big ideas. I just wanted to touch on this just briefly before we get into the meat of the process, because I want to refer back to this in terms of how you map certain principles onto to different areas. But just going through this very quickly, knowledge, it's important to separate people needing to have knowledge and knowing where to go and access knowledge. So where I'd go and look for something or how, uh, who I'd go and ask for something. This has always been important, but with the access that we have to digital materials and digital content and platforms, it's even more important that we make sure that we're not trying to cram into people's heads things they don't actually need to know. So if we can um, make this shift um, from courses to resources, so, um, if you've not heard of him, there's a guy called Nick Shackleton Jones, who is a, a learning designer here in the UK, who um, he's worked for some big organizations uh, like BBC and, and BP. And while he was at the BBC, he coined this phrase, the move from courses to resources. And his sort of suggestion was what we generally did was 80% course and then 20% resources. So you go off on your workshop or you go off and you do your piece of learning and we try and cram everything into that. And then we give you minimal support afterwards. Whereas actually what we should be doing is turning that on its head, minimizing the amount of time that we're spending on formal interventions and those things which are courses and spending much more time working on providing ongoing support in the workplace. So providing resources that people can access at the point where they're carrying out the task. So that, that's a really important point in terms of differentiating between these two things because you design for these two things in very different ways. There are skills. Again, this is not going to be anything new to you, I would think, in terms of skills being split into motor skills and social skills and cognitive skills. These things have, have all been here for a very long time. The only things that change is, I guess, cognitive skills change in as much as the way that we access information and the volume of information and the speed of information and the possibly the lack of trustworthiness around information means that we have to apply our cognitive skills in a different way. And certainly social skills has changed because although direct human to human interaction hasn't changed for a long time, of course, we are spending a lot more time interacting with people in different ways. So it's important to, to factor that in. And then finally, this big ideas, which I said is the one that's often uh, put into uh, design processes attitudes. But we just split this up into key principles and attitudes and beliefs. So attitudes and belief, I, I think is self-explanatory. Key principles being usually those things which are kind of key to how an organization does something. So it's that that phrase that was very popular, I think in the 1990s from people like Tom Peters of um, you know, the way we do things around here. So it's the things that you kind of need people to buy into and, and believe in. The learners, I'm going to, I have a whole bunch of things about learners, but I am just going to put them all up on screen straight away. So with learners, we just need to be clear. What is it they already know? What are their interests and motivation? What are their hopes and fears for this? So what, are, what do they hope to get out of it? What do they worry about? Um, Self-belief, which is something that you may not find in many design processes, but actually, you know, do, do people have the right foundation to start in terms of being able to, to go on whatever our learning journey is? And anything to do with basic skills. So it could be basic numeracy and basic literacy. It could be basic language skills. It could be more technical things like computer literacy. Logistics, I'm going to cover even more quickly because this is just all the, um, the dull stuff that we all have to deal with with every project, which is our audience. Where are they and how many of them are there and how much time can we have and how much of a budget do we have? And how much time do we have to deliver this? And what resources, what people do we need to be involved and what equipment and facilities might we need? So at that point, I want to pause before we move on, having just done that quick recap um, and see if there's any questions before we move into the heart of the design process. 
Hi, Barry. There's um, there's no question so far in the in the Q and A. Um, there was um, a small question or a small comment of um, of perhaps um, if you could slow down a tiny bit just for those who um, who are you know perhaps new to some of these, if that's okay with you. <laughs> Sorry, um, I will slow down as we move into the rest of the content. I really just wanted to get through um, the three L's very quickly because I know hopefully you've all had a chance to, to watch the video. I really just wanted to kind of give a recap just for those people that hadn't um, for sure. asked to watch the video. So um, I will go through the, the rest of it at uh, a, a more steady pace. I have um, an, uh, also a comment from Meredith, um, who I think was talking about the resources that the balance between courses and resources. Um, and really just was she was saying how that was kind of like, oh, that makes so much sense, like a bit of a, a light bulb going off there that it's always after you learn something that you really need the support for for putting that into action and for you know in different ways. Um, I was just wondering just briefly in terms of um, you know the jukebox and pulling it together with Clive, what was the is that just over many years of doing like you just kind of you're like this is or um, what was the where did that come from? What was the process for its development um, with Clive? We just briefly, just so we have a sense of kind of the history of that model. Yeah, um, uh, to be honest, um, it was uh, it's the old thing of you know necessity being the mother of invention, um, and we were working on a project with Plan International, um, and we. I guess we'd been informally using all of the design principles that we have in this process. And some of them were things, I guess, that we had, um, you know, come up with ourselves. Some of them were taking elements and inspiration from other people. So, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things, particularly in terms of the analysis phase, which have been around for, for an incredibly long time. And um, our focus on thing on the performance, so things in terms of, of action and, and doing rather than knowledge, comes from Kathy Moore's uh, action mapping process, which you might have come across. And we had all of these things that they were just really kind of a disparate, um, different elements that we we found ourselves using more and more. And it was purely that we were working on a project that was so big. Um, so Clive and I had our own business, and there were four of us in the company. But the project was so big that I think we had to take on seven external learning designers um, for a program to be delivered incredibly quickly. So it really was the necessity was to sit down and actually document what it was that we were doing and make sure that everyone was consistent. And so it almost kind of accidentally then turned into the book. Great. Necessity is the mother of invention, indeed. <laughs> it's it's not the most exciting of stories. Um, it's just that we, uh, we had to do it. But I think we probably would have got there eventually. But it was important for us to, to, you know, to codify how we do everything. Great. And there's, there's no other questions so far. So I think we're good to, to plow ahead. Okay, I think um, were somewhat a couple of people. I just created a quick look in the chat myself that people didn't uh, see about the video. Um, so the video is um, it, it is it goes into more depth in terms of the three L's in possibly a slightly unexpected way, but I'm not going to tell you why it's unexpected um, for those of you that haven't watched it. Um, it will it will fill in the gaps, and also just I mean I think you've been answering the questions, but um, I'm more than happy. I have a there's a PDF of all these slides. I'm more than happy to share that with everyone. I know there's going to be the the recording, and I'm also very happy to kind of you know if there's questions that come up after the event. If everyone has questions, then please, um, you know, I'll make sure you've got a way to to get those questions to me. Shall I carry on? Sounds good. Okie dokie. So <clears throat> back to the jukebox. So the next uh, spot on the jukebox is we're going to move uh, at a, a bit slower pace now. We'll move into the heart of things, which is th that middle area you can see, which is preparation, input, application, and follow up, the strategies and the social context. So if I was working my way through this process, um, I'm starting at the top with the need. I'm going through the learners, the learning, the logistics in terms of identifying what it is we need to actually teach people and who they are and where they are and all of those kind of things. And then usually the first step is going through uh, the middle part of 
the design process. So uh, preparation, input, application, and follow-up, which is easily, we're easily reminded of this thanks to, to this person here. Um, I don't have many interactive parts in here, but would anyone like to pop in the chat who this person is? I wish <laughs> Meredith says I wish I knew. <laughs> okay, well, if you ever read the book, you'll find there are a lot of puns um, on the topic of having no regrets. Uh, this is Edith Piaf, um, famous, um, well, maybe not that famous, but uh, with a famous French singer from the Second World War who, who sang um, a song called Je ne regrette rien. Um, and so we took her name, Piaf, and made use of this to remind us about Piaf. Um, I like to explain this because I was warned once that you should be very wary of convenient four-letter acronyms. And I think I've just demonstrated that this is the most awkward and clumsy four-letter acronym that you'll ever come across. So therefore, it should be reliable. So PF, preparation, input, application and follow-up. If I go through these steps, preparation is the stage of preparing the learners for the learning and preparing the learning for the learners. What does that mean in practice? This is where we are making sure that the learners have whatever prior knowledge, skills, understanding, experience that they need to have before they can move on to whatever the next step is. So I, it's often the stuff that gets treated as pre-work, but I'm just always a bit wary about the term pre-work because as soon as you say pre, it sounds like something separate to the, the real learning. But it's, it might be something very simple. It might just be making sure that someone knows where and when something is in a little bit of pre-reading. It might be we're doing some kind of pre-assessment with people. So I said about preparing the learners for the learning, but when you think about preparing the learning for the learners, it may be we do some kind of pre-assessment activity so that we can then adapt and modify the learning content to make sure that it better suits the need of a particular audience. It's largely about making sure we're setting people's expectations of what is going to happen and making sure they're fully prepared. Input, the I, this is the bit that um, as learning professionals, we're generally really good at. So this is the bit of delivering content, delivering activities to our audience, whether that is face to face in the classroom, whether that's in a virtual classroom, whether that's through you know, self-study materials like e-learning. It's all of the things where it's the push of content from us to the learner in, in some way, shape or form. It's, it's all learning activity. The A is application. And this is that opportunity for learners to apply what it is that they've learned. And as much as possible, we would like this to happen in the most realistic way possible. So ideally, um, application happens in the workplace, on the job, um, wherever the performance needs to happen. The reality is that for some things that's fine. So I worked with a chain of opticians where we were teaching people how to make recommendations on the kind of glasses that suit someone's face. Someone can complete a learning activity and then they can actually go and do that on the shop floor advising customers being observed by an experienced colleague. The worst that can go wrong is that the colleague has to step in and, and maybe make another suggestion. The obvious example at the other extreme is that if we want someone to fly an airliner full of people, we, you know, it's a long, long time before they actually get to doing that for real or even flying an empty plane. There's a whole load of simulation that comes before. The big thing though with the application, it must be realistic. Um, uh, my my pet hate with application um, would be things like role plays in the classroom because they are usually so far away from the real experience of, of what someone does. So it's critical that application really is about application on the job or the closest we can possibly get in terms of simulating it. And then follow up is all of those things that happen after the event. So thinking about courses versus resources, resources generally fall, fall into the, um, the follow up. So these are all the things that we are leaving behind post intervention. So 
Um, and just to clarify, anything that we are doing is always going to be part of the I and the A. So if we say we're going to have a program of learning and, as, and afterwards there will be uh, you know, three or four coaching calls with people, we haven't got as far as the follow up because the coaching calls are not part of the follow up. Follow up is always entirely optional and driven by learners. So it's more around resources we might leave in place. Um, so resources that will help on the job. Uh, recommendations for books to read, videos to watch, other courses to go on. The other thing with, with PF is that it doesn't always neatly work in these four steps. So sometimes it looks more like this. So this um, is a typical, um, well, I suppose typical of many kind of learning interventions, but the, the most basic one I would use with this is something like learning to ride a bike. So if you're teaching someone how to ride a bicycle, you know, we start with preparation. We're making sure that someone knows what's going to happen. And then there's one bit of input. So that might be how to pedal and then have a go. We have some practice. And then the next thing might be how to steer, how to use the handlebars. So that input and then we'll have another bit of application and then how to use the brakes and so on and so forth. And that tends to be the same in um, unless it's a very, very small learning intervention that tends to be the kind of design process that we're taking through, um, you know, whether it's a workshop or a live session um, or any kind of program of learning. And it doesn't always neatly even go IAIA. So it might be that there's an awful lot of input that happens before we get to the application. So it depends on the complexity of the topic and the level of, of knowledge that someone needs before they can actually kind of have that go and practice. And there's also the possibility that, you know, with the follow up, if you're thinking about resources that we're going to put in place, if you were running, um, you know, a, say, a leadership program over a year, you wouldn't necessarily wait right until the end to put some of the follow up elements into place. You might provide resources all the way through the program so that people can pick those up whenever they want and refer back to them whenever they want. So that's PF. That's the middle part of the process. We're now going to move on and have a look at strategy. And this is probably, um, as long as we're clear that our learning need is absolutely clear, getting the strategy right is probably the single most important part of the process. And it's the bit that uh, once you, you understand it is the bit that people seem to find most helpful in making that jump from you know, doing traditional classroom based content to doing something um, that's more digital. So strategies. Um, this, uh, this is Socrates. Um, I'm not going to go back through a whole history of learning. The only reason for having Socrates here is to say that the four learning strategies, teaching strategies um, are the same ones that were around back when Socrates was around. So he would recognize these, um, these strategies. They don't change. They are the strategies that we were all using, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, they are the strategies we'll be using in five or 10 years time. These things don't ever change. Everything else we can do with them changes, but these don't change. So the first strategy is exposition, which is um, a, a simple, one way push of information from an expert to a learner. So exposition takes many, many forms, um, but probably some of the, the more obvious ones would be videos are often exposition, books are exposition, um, conferences, lectures are exposition. An awful lot of what we're doing right now is exposition. It is always a one way flow and in exposition as a strategy, the most important part, the most important person in the, in the exposition strategy is, to, is usually really the teacher because exposition is about expert knowledge. So it is about the, whether that is, uh, exposition is done live or whether the exposition is, you know, it's written or recorded, that needs to be completely accurate. So that's what, that's the most important um, element in the process. The second strategy is instruction. So this is teaching somebody and usually teaching somebody how to do something. And this is something that, you know, we all do a great deal in our, in our jobs, in, in our work in design. 
And here, the instructor, the facilitator is still important, but this becomes much more of an equal kind of relationship between um, our learner has to be you know, actively engaged in things and our facilitator needs to be engaged in things. So instruction is, it's, it's very common in the world of uh, digital learning to talk about instructional design. Um, and the, quite often instructional design does focus on instruction as a strategy, but it, it, it always assumes that we need to teach people how to do something. The third is guided discovery. Um, guided discovery, we're shifting very much more towards the learner experience. <coughs> Excuse me. With guided discovery, we are presenting our learner with a situation, um, either real or simulated, and putting them through an experience so that they ultimately reach their own conclusions about something. So the clue here being that it's guided, we don't just want them to reach any conclusion, we are usually guiding them to a certain conclusion, but this is where we address things like why you should do something, why you should um, address things in a particular way, why you should behave in a certain way, why you should follow a certain policy, why you should adhere to certain standards. The final strategy is exploration. And exploration is linked very tightly with the, um, the follow-up stage because exploration, again, is 100% learner-driven. So exploration is optional. Exploration is always the choice of the learner, whether or not they want to go on and they want to further explore a topic. If we just think about the four of them together um, and think back to what I said earlier about knowledge, skills, and big ideas, if our problem is a knowledge problem, it is most likely that the strategy that we would use is exposition, because exposition is a great way to tell people stuff. And if someone doesn't know something, the simplest way to make sure they do know something is to tell them. If it is a skills issue, then an element of that is likely to be instruction. So we're teaching somebody how to do things, how to do things in a particular way. If it comes down to um, the big ideas, so we're talking about the attitudes and the key principles, the most likely strategy is guided discovery. And then exploration potentially can cover any of these, but as I say, that, that's the learner-driven optional thing that comes afterwards. What you've probably already identified is that in any learning design, um, why I said that you know, for me, every kind of learning design is blended, we're using a combination of these different strategies so if you think about um, you know, running a one day workshop, you're very unlikely to come in and run a one day workshop, which is all exposition, because that would just be you standing up and lecturing a group of people. You probably aren't going to be doing a workshop that is 100 percent instruction unless you're teaching someone to do something practical. So, I mean, if you're doing maybe IT training, so teaching someone to use Photoshop or something, or if you were doing some kind of practical skills, that might be almost entirely instruction, but usually there's a balance of exposition and instruction. And then for a lot of the work we do, there are those elements of guided discovery where we're putting people through experiences or exposing them to situations and information that will persuade them why we should do something. What's really important when we're moving from classroom to digital is that in the classroom, we can kind of mix these things together very easily. We can, you know, the, the lines between one thing and another blur. We don't necessarily sit down and design a classroom activity and say that chunk will be exposition and that chunk will be instruction, that chunk will be guided discovery. The thing, they tend to kind of weave in and out of each other. But when we're designing for digital, we usually need to make clearer decisions. So we can, within a, an individual digital activity, we can combine all of these but it's helpful for us to identify which elements fall under each strategy because it's gonna guide us in decision-making further on around the social context, which I'll get to in just a second, and the delivery medium. So the type of, of tools that you might use to create content. So let's move on and, and have a, a look at social context. So this is uh, the section here. Um, again, there are four um, social contexts. Again, these don't change. These are the same ones that we have been using forever and the same ones we will use forever. And social contexts 
there is individual. So I think that's pretty self-explanatory. The learner is working completely independently and alone. So whatever content they've got is some kind of self-study material. Although um, maybe practice, so application can often happen as an individual. So it might be something that, that's very individual and personal. We have one-to-one -one and we're very specific about when we say one-to-one, -one, we do mean one-to-one. -one. Those things where it's critical as part of our design that the relationship, excuse me, <coughs> that there is a relationship between two individuals. So that might be something quite formal, like a coaching relationship or a mentor relationship. It could be an individual facilitator. It could be uh, a conversation with a manager. It could be working alongside um, an experienced colleague, but it's always two people working one-to-one. -one. Then we have group, and it's really important to be clear that when we're talking about group as a, a social context, we're not talking about group in the logistical sense. So we're not talking about the convenience of bringing people together. So if you think about going to a conference, uh, you might go into a room with 300 people and there's someone up on stage and they'll present for an hour and then you all leave. That was not a group activity. A group activity is where the learning can only happen by learner interacting with another learner or other learners. The learning cannot happen in any other way. And this is a, a really, really important thing to consider because it's this need for group that helps you make a decision around, well, would I do something face-to-face? -face? Would I do something live online in a virtual classroom? Or actually, can I potentially do this some other way? So do we maybe sell study materials or something? Because there are so many times when you think about a workshop experience where there are things that are absolutely critical that we have a group activity, but not all of the content in a face-to-face -face workshop does necessarily require um, group activity. Some of it may be exposition. Some of it may just be us presenting content. So it's important to isolate the group activities so that we can split the group activities away from the individual activities and work out where we do need to, to have people interacting. The last social context uh, is community. And community differs from groups in that groups tend to be, I mean, there are no, there's no numerical limits on this, but groups tend to be relatively small. Um, groups tend to have um, either a shared interest in something or they are a group because they have been selected within an organization as people with a similar responsibility. Communities can be small, but communities tend to be bigger. Communities tend to cross more boundaries. So communities, we are talking about communities of practice. We're talking about communities of interest. We're talking about communities that might be within an organization or go beyond organizational or geographical boundaries. Which seems like another good point um, to pause and uh, see if there's any more questions. Thanks, Barry. So um, just a, a, th there are some questions that we had to begin with as well. Um, and they'll just like remind people that feel free to populate the Q&A with questions as we go along. But then also we're going to finish off once you get the full picture with some more questions. But I think this one really, Barry, um, kind of resonates with a, with a lot of folks like understanding kind of some of these social context issues as you had mentioned, like going towards a virtual experience. And this is where I think, because we're so used to using group work, so used to using group work, like in a face-to-face -face workshop or training. Um, and I think one of the things that we use that for is to keep people engaged. And one of the questions that we had from the group before is like, how do you make sure participants are engaged in the training and not just doing other work? And, you know, is would you say that sometimes group work even like that you design group work into something to, as a kind of mutual accountability mechanism to kind of keep people, you know, you do breakaway rooms and there's kind of this like peer accountability mechanism where it's like everybody's participating because they've been put in a group or to kind of keep people like, is that something that you think is a good reason to do group or do you feel like 
that's something that you know you don't do it just because of that like you know just some thoughts on on using it in that way <laughs> hmm. um I, I don't know that it's necessarily a, a good reason to do to do group work if there's no other reason to do group work um i i think it's incredibly important that we are doing group work where what matters is the exposure to the ideas of other people in the group and where you'll get that cross fertilization of ideas. Um, one of the things that's important to say with group is that group doesn't necessarily mean live. So a group activity can be asynchronous, which we'll get to shortly. A group activity can be in a discussion forum or a WhatsApp group. A, a group activity can take place over a long period of time. I think what what is important is that if you are having a program that has a lot of self-study, um, so people are off working on their own and at their own pace, it's very easy for people to drift. It's very easy for people to not know, you know how well they're doing. I think it's important that there are points at which people check in along the process. So there needs to be certain deliverables. I mean, that could be things like people doing assignments and submitting work for grading, but that feels very kind of clunky and formal. I think having group activities where you're coming together to discuss, to debrief the things that you have learned are, can be really powerful. The main thing is, is groups are not good for consumption of content. If ultimately what we're doing is presenting content, then groups are not a good way to do it. You'd be you're better off to do that um, you know, through pretty much any other, any other um, social context other than group if it's all about delivery. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's kind of a, sorry, a slightly around, around the houses kind of answer. But yes, I, I think in the context of a blend, I would use um, a group. I think, honestly, if we're talking about a virtual classroom, um, and, and what we're trying to do is sort of, you know, put in things to engage people, because the, otherwise the, the topic is not engaging. I think we're probably just doing the wrong thing anyway by doing a virtual mm. classroom. I think, you know, mm. it's, um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, and just going back to kind of something I've heard you talk about quite a bit, which is like, you know, you, you design it specifically for the learning objectives and not get sidetracked with other motivations. Um, thanks, Barry. Um, a couple of questions from participants. Um, um, one question, uh, do you have an example of a purely exploratory exercise in a virtual space and, and when would you use such an approach? So that's one, I'll give you a couple, you can decide what you wanna. Um, uh, from Natalie, uh, do you have an example, oh, sorry, um, how much time should you spend on an in, on instruction in a digital space? So should you look at kind of limiting, I guess, some of the uh, exposition or instruction content because it be can become, um, quite overwhelming in a in a virtual space. It can in face to face too, but just a sense of whether you would well, how you would consider the amount of time that you spend on instruction. Um, and then finally, Meredith um, was asking, um, do you mean that a lot of what we do in a day long workshop in terms of group work might actually be condensed in a digital setting because not everything needs to be done in a group. A lot of it can be done alone or just between two people. Like, do you, have you found kind of if certain efficiencies? Um, in, in a digital environment as opposed to um, uh, in person? I can repeat those questions if you need. Yeah, no, I've, I've kind of, I've made some notes. Um, so, when we talk, if we go back to the um, exploratory act exercises and how much time spent on instruction in a digital space or in, in a virtual space, are we talking, uh, are we thinking like virtual classroom, live online, or are we just thinking about any kind of, blend any digital design? Do you get I, a think, sense of that? I think any kind, um, just a sense of kind of when you, um, like an example of the ex of, of exploratory content um, and, and what that could look like um, in that, in a virtual space, but then, you know, also in terms of how much time could you spend on that and, and what would, how do you support that virtually? Okay, so the good the thing with, with exploratory is that you don't support it. I mean, that, that's the, the, the big thing, is that exploratory is 100% learner driven. So it's exploratory and 
follow up kind of map onto each other and we're talking a lot of it's about resources so it's those things that you might design that someone can go back and call upon in order to be able to uh you know to, to do whatever you know the, the workplace performance is um trying to think of i mean <laughs> trying to think of a specific example because a lot of the time um it will tend to be things like you know if it's a, a general subject like leadership then you've probably got book recommendations, you've probably got links off to TED videos and uh, YouTube videos. Um, sometimes it is just curated content. Sometimes you are designing things specifically for, you know, for people to come back and refer to at particular stages in, a, you know, in the application of things. Um, I'm doing uh, some, the, the capability building stuff that I do, um, I've been doing with the National Health Service, um, with a group of them here in the UK. And we're doing some work around um, design tools. So what, what are the, um, the, the digital tools to use? How, how do you go about selecting certain tools? How do you go about using certain tools? And the way we've designed that is that everybody has presented some questions up front. So I've, I've designed um, some very simple resources and some, and some responses. But before anything else happens to that, we will come together for a virtual session, a live session. But I, I don't have any content for the live session. The live session will be entirely Q&A. So trying to get to the root of what are the problems that they're trying to solve and what kind of tools might help them. What will follow that is I will come away from that with a list of all the things they need to do. And I will then create resources that they will then call on so that then becomes that's exploratory content because that's all follow up there'll be no direct support from me there's, there's no l d kind of support it's entirely at that stage it becomes self-driven self-study self-access great um, thanks and that, i think that's super helpful it's it's you know can be used in so many different ways like whether it's kind of asking participants to um you know, research or dig into a specific topic to bring to the next or like to find it, like to go find their own examples or like, I think one of the things like that would be kind of mixed with like the application part, right? Would be like using their critical thinking skills on their own independently to explore different different topics or different. Yeah, um, I mentioned the uh, the glasses, the, the frame styling um, example. Um, and that's a good one where we had a blend of instruction which was um you know some some stuff around colors and and you know frame shapes versus face shapes and hairstyles and all of those kind of things then you had the application which was uh, the the bit where you're going to practice and you're being observed by um, experienced colleagues and then the follow-up was something that um we then kind of dripped out over about a year with additional things around you know as new styles came out we were producing materials kind of you know giving some encouragement around how you might promote you know new styles but you know map those to trends in fashions and things i mean clearly you've been working with me jen you know i don't have any of that fashion sense um you know that was coming from the organization but we were putting that together in terms of uh, you know resources that will support you over time and we did that for for a year i think we were putting things out every couple of months and then they picked that up and then started to produce that kind of thing themselves as there was more and more people that were trained on the same process they could then effectively they they then build their own follow-up and they build their own exploration content great thanks barry i think the other two questions are kind of tied a little bit so just um maybe um i know i don't know how we're doing for time i think if like just a couple more minutes on this but um so the two questions of kind of are there efficiencies that can be found in by by going virtual so um you know can we reduce the amount of time because we don't need to do everything in a group because we're not in a in a face-to-face -face environment so are there efficiencies there which is kind of also tied with is there kind of a ratio or a rule of thumb about limiting the amount of instruction time in a virtual space. I mean, we've all done those e-learning click through the presentation, mind numbing, right? Like that's so it, like what you know, in terms of just your experience, is there a rule of thumb there? And then kind of do you want to be careful about how much you convert things to just instruction, even to find those efficiencies? Um yeah. Um I I don't I don't think that there's any particular time limits. I don't think there's any particular ratios. I mean, it, it's going to sound um, 
it's probably not particularly helpful. It sounds very flippant, but to say that you know things need to be as long as they need to be and no longer. But the question of how long things should be um, is, you know, that's going to vary massively from topic to topic. So you can say that um, if you think about instruction, if you take something like, um, you know, my, so my, my midlife crisis is at the age of 49, I decided to learn how to play guitar. Um, which is much cheaper than buying a Porsche or all those other things that people do and or you know men particularly do when they're having a midlife crisis. So I am doing that through a combination of some live lessons with somebody and lots and lots of videos and I've got a couple of books. That's all instruction and I probably spend you know 30 minutes to an hour a day working through that. And that's fine. And I'm, I'd be perfectly happy if I spend another couple of years working my way through 30 to 60 minutes of content every day. Um, on a smaller scale, if you think about things like uh, learning how to use Photoshop, if you go onto LinkedIn Learning, you will find, you know, video courses that are 16 hours long. Um, and if you think about in practice, that's going to take you a lot longer than 16 hours because you're not just going to sit there and watch 16 hours of content. You're going to watch a bit and do a bit and watch a bit and do a bit. So that 16 hours probably turns into 64 hours in term, you know, by the time you've got some application in there. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that matters. And it's absolutely fine. If the content is useful, if the content is going to help the learner achieve what it is they need to do, then I don't think there's really any limit. I think if you're looking at taking something that was previously a one day workshop, um, I mean, I don't think, I mean, I wouldn't change anything from, you know, from exposition to instruction or instruction to guided discovery. I mean, you're, you're still kind of separating out the elements. Mm -hmm. If there's a chunk of things in there that, um, that don't need to happen with think about logistically with a group of people together so we're not talking about we don't need a group as in a learning activity but if there are things where it's i can consume the content and then we can come together and do the group activity there are huge efficiencies mm -hmm. i mean that's that's generally how i go about designing things when i would include um live content is you know we don't do much in the way of instruction live online it, it's a painful mm -hmm. process as a mm -hmm. facilitator it's a painful process as a student so instruction often gets done separately as a self-study exercise and then we come together as a live group to go through a set and, and debrief and you know look at what, what does this actually mean in practice mm -hmm. i think there's also you know a couple of things just to to add to barry i think there's it's also really interesting because i think in face-to-face -face, um environments we're hesitant to include a lot of exposition in terms of like, you know, articles to read or videos to watch because it feels awkward and like a waste of time when we're all together. So we tend to go more towards group work and applicate, you know, and, and those engagement things. And I think it's interesting the opportunities provided in a virtual environment to actually have a bit more exploration, independent exploration and stuff that you might not kind of put into um, a face to face necessarily. I, I always like to say that what digital does is frees you from the tyranny of time and location. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think one of the things with, um, you know, when, when you have a group, when you bring people together, there is to a degree, you kind of, you have to justify having them together as a group. So as you say, you know, you wouldn't say, okay, everyone just sit there and watch this 15 minute video. It just if, certainly if it's a one day workshop, um, that would feel like a very odd thing to do. But to be able to do that in a digital environment where you can say, you know, go off and watch this video and then we're going to come together and, and discuss it, that can be really powerful. And, you know, you could do that, you know, that can be a long time in advance or it could be um, we're going to jump online, we're going to come live online, we spend 30 minutes 20 minutes, whatever it needs to be, it doesn't really matter, whatever amount of time to kind of set things up. And then we're going to take a break for 45 minutes. And in that 45 minutes, I want you to watch this 15 minute video. So you can go and have a cup of tea and a biscuit and do all the other things you want to do, but watch this video. And then we're going to come back together and then we're going to talk about things. So it's, it's just thinking about those things that work well 
you know, virtually live, those things that work well when they're self-study and those things that need to be a blend of both. Great, thanks for that, Barry. I think um, those are all the questions for now, if if you wanna go ahead. Cool, okay, I sh I'm gonna, um, I should probably get through the next bit relatively quickly, I think anyway. So uh, let's, uh, let's carry on through the jukebox. So um, we're gonna start over on the uh, right hand side now looking at delivery channels. Okay, this, this is the simplest bit of the lot. If we think about delivery channels, there are three. This is why I only have one slide here. It's not even worth um, having a build for this. There are only three delivery channels face-to-face. -face. So physically in person at the same time in the same physical location as somebody. Offline. So that is some kind of digital materials or you know, a book, for example, any kind of materials that the learner can access at their convenience without any requirement of being online. And online are those things that require our learners to have an internet connection of some description. So if you just, just quickly thinking about them face to face, I think it's fairly obvious in terms of face to face. We all know what face to face is. We're all used to doing face to face training. but more than ever, we need to, you know, not even just thinking about current circumstances, but thinking about environmental impacts and, you know, cost of travel and everything else. There has to be a really good reason to bring people together face to face. And sometimes there is absolutely no other way of doing things. I would not want to get in a car with somebody who was you know, taught to drive by someone who wasn't in the car with them. I, I want, you know, a surgeon to have been trained face to face in terms of, of carrying out surgery. I, there's a whole load of things that must happen face to face. But more and more, particularly with content, again, with the content consum consumption element of things, we can use offline and we can use online. So I said offline, we've got things like books. Uh, we've also got things like eBooks because you might need to be connected at the point you download an eBook to your Kindle or whatever other device, but you don't necessarily have to be connected after that. Um, I've also designed solutions, which are things that would normally be delivered, um, you know, self-study content online. So someone might go to a learning platform to, to log in and get things but simply because we have challenges of, of connectivity and bandwidth, what we've done is we've taken that content, packaged it up, put it onto a USB stick and posted it to them. It's, you know, it's as simple as that. And online covers, you know, access to self-study content. So things I've already mentioned like LinkedIn learning and, you know, the Skillshare and Udemy um, and TED Talks and YouTube and all of those things, but also all the stuff that we would do in terms of live online or jumping on a, a, a coaching call with someone on Zoom, um, anything at all that requires connectivity. These things really are, a lot of these are driven by logistics. So beyond those certain things that absolutely for the learning experience have to be face-to-face, -face, and they're, they're very few. There are very few that absolutely critically must happen face-to-face, -face, but there are some. In most cases, these decisions get, get made based on logistics. So can, you know, how much time do people have? What's the budget that we have? How quickly do we need to do this? They, they drive these decisions. Um, they also tend to drive the, the next decision, which is around communication mode. And this is even simpler because with communication mode, there are only two, either same time or its own time. So same time, synchronous, we are all carrying out the learning activity at the same time, own time. We might be doing the same activity, but we are doing it um, at different times and in different places. So I said about things like a group activity can be, you know, it's quite, quite often a group activity at the same time, we will jump onto to our Zoom or, or Skype or whatever, or be in a classroom. But a group activity can also be done in your own time because it could be done through a discussion forum or a WhatsApp group or a Facebook group or, or whatever else. Um, what I've done is put together um, just over the next four slides, just some quick examples. Um, I won't necessarily go through all of these because so you'll get these the, the, the slides afterwards, but just quickly some examples of things that fall into um, the different strategies and the kind of, you know, that they're fed into by the, um, the, the delivery channel and the communication mode. So exposition, 
the whole thing was exposition. It's, it's around that thing of, of giving expertise, as I said. And to some degree, it's about the inspiration and getting you hooked in and, and, and getting some, some interest. And, you know, we've got some examples here, like, you know, podcasts and PDFs and eBooks. Um, these are all things that work well for exposition. For instruction, it's around knowledge. So it's what are the things that, you know, you need to know in terms of being able to do something. So it's not just knowing something, it is the being able to do something. So what are the steps in the process? If I'm going to use Photoshop and I want to make this image from color to black and white, what is the, the steps that I go through? It's quite often instruction forms part of the practice and we might be doing testing and some, and some kind of measurement as well. And we've got things like interactive tutorials and quizzes and, and stuff in here, and things like skill building apps, um, things like Duolingo, um, which is a great example of language learning skills. Guided discovery, um, this is, as I said, is around that kind of wanting people to adopt certain attitudes, certain behaviours. And in some cases, you can have content that does the whole thing. So things like interactive scenarios and simulations, which can be um, you know, simulations in particular, you know, they're designed to, to feel very real. So you're putting people through real experiences. But often it's that combination, I suppose, similar to, to what we were just talking around with things like, you know, you get people to watch a video and then we come together and we have a discussion. And that discussion could be live or that discussion could be, you know, asynchronous in a, in a forum. Um, and then finally, we have exploration, um, which is the, the reference materials, the additional non-essential stuff, the things for learners to explore. I've listed a few things here which go away from websites to virtual reality. The reality is that pretty much anything in terms of any kind of format can really be included under exploration because there's any way that people can access content in the future. I mentioned earlier on um, a guy called Nick Shackleton Jones. Um, I just want to, to show you this. This was um, a slide I saw in a presentation that he did, which I've, I've pinched from him, um, because I think it's just a really good way to help you think about when would you do particular things? And I, I like this continuum that goes from the care less to, to care more. So on the left hand side, we've got this, you know, the organization, you know, is pushing out information to an audience that doesn't particularly care about things. So it's where the organization wants to convince you or inspire you or engage you or wants you to get, you know, understand why. This is guided discovery. This, this is the experience. And this is, you know, this continuum that includes stories and things as well. So it's a, it's a quite rich experience. Over on the other side, which is the, the pool content, the things that learners tend to care about more is that just give me that support and guidance. Just give me practical things. Just tell me how I do something. So it is a lot of it is those resources that come in afterwards. And that is the checklists and the guides and the simple supporting resources. Um, thinking about time, I'm just, I had another question break in, but before we get to that, I'm, I'm gonna skip a slide. Just wanna show you this really quickly because I think this is, we'll do this and then I think that brings us to a nice point to kind of wrap things up and, and, um, and answer any other questions. People feel very pressured to try and do everything. And this for me is, is just a, a way of mapping out that there are a whole bunch of different skills involved in creating digital content. So on our little triangle here, we have learning at the top, um, creative over on the right hand side, technical at the bottom and managerial in the middle. And things tend to go on a bit of a continuum. So I'm assuming that as learning professionals, the thing that we do best, the thing where we add the most value to the organization is in learning design. So that's, that's where we are, we're sitting there at the top. And people tend to either lean towards, you know, creative things. So they might do learning design and then they might do a little bit of writing and some graphics and imagery and maybe move into animation and things like that. Or they tend to have a more technical bent so they might lean on into authoring tools and configuring systems and all that kind of thing. The important thing to keep in mind is that at the extremes, these are expert roles. And, you know, as Jen said, I've been doing this since 2003. I have yet to meet anybody that can do all of this 
on the triangle. There's nobody that I have ever come across that has really great learning design skills, has really great creative skills, and has really in-depth technical skills. So if you're looking at things and thinking, I don't know this, just it's absolutely fine. Your expertise should be at the top. Work out the other things that you should sensibly do, and then work out where maybe you need to you know, develop some skills, where it's worthwhile if you develop in skills. But don't become a programmer just because you think that digital learning requires some technical skills. Hire a programmer to do things. Don't get into you know, directing film and, and editing videos and things because you think that that's something that you, you need to have as a skill. You can just outsource that to someone. Keep that focus at the top. Keep the focus on the learning design because that's the bit that will make the most difference to your audience. Which does bring us to a final set of questions. Great, thanks, thanks, Barry. Um, and I think that that's a great spot for the question we have um, about around kind of motivation and looking at kind of. I think there's a, a, an assumption amongst most of us that um, that face to face increases motivation, participation. That that they're um, you know they're especially for the work that we do in gender equality and gender equality training. There's the sense that in order to achieve attitudinal change and really kind of ignite passion and and um, step amongst participants, that that face to face is really what we need. Have you found that there are some trade offs that um, face to face really does kind of maintain that, or that um, that it's really about the learning design? <laughs> I, I think you, I mean, you you laughed when you asked that question because you know what I'm going to say, which is it's all about the learning design. I mean, the, the world, uh, the world is full of good learning content and bad learning content, irrespective of whether it's done in the classroom, or whether it's done digitally. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I'm just looking, I, I've just brought up the Q&A uh, and I can see the question from Meredith there. Um, around the you know that dedicating the time and energy to be there means you know you've kind of got some engagement and commitment, and I, I don't you know I completely agree with that. I mean I I run a, a five day digital work uh, design workshop here in the UK, and you know when someone turns up to that workshop and they've committed five days of their time, I know that that person is engaged. Very rarely does someone come up you know because they've been forced to do it. They're there because they are really engaged in things. But equally, I've done and, and I'm doing now digital design programs where there are no face to face activities at all. Everything is a combination of self study content and coming together virtually. And I don't I'm not experiencing any lack of um, engagement and energy and enthusiasm. Um, people. I, I think it, it comes always comes down to are things useful to people? I mean, that, that's my biggest takeaway in, in 25 years of being involved in, in people stuff. If something is useful to people, they will be engaged. If someone cannot see how what you are providing is useful to them and their audience, it doesn't really matter how you present it, whether it's at a conference or in a classroom or digitally, they won't be engaged. Engagement, I mean, I, I will happily say the research, I mean, if we, we look at what started off with um, the, um, the no, no substantial uh, difference um, phenomena, and I think there's been something like a further 500 studies since, pretty much everything leans towards the same thing, that there is no difference. There's no difference in terms of engagement. There's no difference in terms of learning outcomes, whether you do things in the classroom or whether you do things face to face. Um, you know, We've probably also all experienced a classroom experience that wasn't particularly engaging. Um, you know, you, you can disengage people or engage people irrespective of, of how you go about doing it. And um, and also, you know, I think a, there was a question as well from from the beginning and from prior to the um, to the um, session um, in our discussions within the gender equality working group around. What's the best approach when you have a connectivity issues or um, technical issues? Like just, you know, it, it, it seems that um, in this world right now, many of our colleagues are, are working to kind of translate gender trainings, gender equality trainings to their global colleagues and partners. Um, but obviously that's fraught with a lot of logistical challenges and stuff. And do you have any kind of recommendations or experiences of where approaches that you've taken to kind of mitigate some of those? 
Yeah, I, I think the first challenge is, is that the assumption is always that we've been doing things live in the classroom. So what we need to do is translate that into live online. And I, I mean, hopefully, having gone through the design process, hopefully, you know, we're we're kind of being clear that that isn't necessarily the case. That we don't, you know, classroom does not necessarily map directly onto live online. So there's a whole bunch of things that you potentially can take out, which can be delivered in other formats. But even then, that doesn't mean that those connectivity issues aren't still a challenge. So, um, you know, you, you listed at the beginning some of the NGOs that I've worked with, and, and there's one I'm working with at the moment where, um, well, we just finished just before Christmas, their um, induction program for, for all new uh, joiners into the organization. It simply, it is all, self-study with some elements of discussion with their, their local manager. But there are some locations where it simply cannot be done online. So that's one of those examples where we have, uh, we have it on a learning management system, but we've replicated all of the content into a format where either, if you're in a location where there's occasional good connection, you can go to that location, you can download the content, you can work on it, and then you can um, you know, upload it later or it is posted out on a USB stick. You pop it into your laptop and you have all of the content. If you need to do things live and, you know, if you go back one step, so if you're thinking about a design and part of your logistics has identified that actually we have people who have no connectivity or poor connectivity or occasional connectivity, then live online learning becomes a luxury so you would only want to put it in if you absolutely can't avoid it, if, you, if, if there's nothing else you could do, because you, you have the risk that you take something that could be, you know, maybe it would be better if it was live, but it can kind of be OK if it's self-study. And by giving someone a really bad live online experience, you actually make the whole thing worse. What you could do is, and I've done this, uh, I think, Jen, I might have, I've told you about a, a similar kind of program I did, where, you know, using virtual classrooms, even using Skype was just a no-no. We did, just did not have the capacity to do that. There, you know, people just couldn't do it. So what we did was we sent out materials. So some cases, emails were sent out with materials. In some cases, things were physically posted. And we did conference calls. We jumped on the phone. So for those elements where we needed to to debrief things where we need to have discussions around things. We did it on the phone because pretty much everyone at some point could get access to a phone. I think if we get to a point where we don't even have that level of access, I, I think we're, well, we're scuppered really with anything to do with virtual, but don't, don't ignore those simple things like the good old fashioned conference call. Great, thanks Gray, that's, that's super helpful. I think as well, Meredith was pointing out as well that it, it kind of goes back to that initial, how you pointed out at the beginning, like looking at that needs assessment, like looking at your understanding of the learner, not just in terms of setting the goal for like the overall goal, but also understanding what some of the limitations are. So for example, the project that we're working on now and looking at ministers needing to kind of consume content on their mobile phones and having limited, you know, blocks of time so a lot of it is asynchronous and we're, you know, keeping the content short so that it's not, you know, so so we feel like the, the greatest likelihood that they'll be able to complete it. So like the, that kind of, it would be really interesting. Do you, are there any kind of needs assessment resources or guidelines from that perspective that you might be able to share after the call? I know that that's something that, um, as you know, is, is always a challenge is to actually have a meaningful needs assessment to really understand all of those angles. Mm. Um, what I'm very happy to share is um, to go with the need and the three L's. We have a design template that we use, uh, which has a whole bunch of questions in around you know, the, the things you would ask in a needs assessment. I, I am always, I like to be clear, it's not intended that you would sit down with a document and you know read off each question. The idea is that you need to ask whatever questions you need to fully answer each of the questions on there so it might be you need to ask half a dozen questions to answer one topic on there but it does include things like um you know access to technology and experience with technology um and 
but you know when you're thinking about people's digital experience i would rarely ask people about um th their experience of learning so don't ask people about what kind of digital learning tools um th that, that they like i would ask people about their experience of um digital as a whole so do you shop online how do you communicate with your friends um, so if you find that you, you, everyone is saying, oh, yeah, I spend lots of time on Facebook, that doesn't mean you should be using Facebook as a way to, um, to deliver learning. But that means you could probably get away with um, doing some kind of discussion forums. If people say, I generally, you know, I, all my friends I communicate with on WhatsApp, um, on my phone, then design for WhatsApp or Telegram or Signal or something similar. Try and keep, you know, ask them questions around their, their real life experience, not learning experience, and focus on delivering things in a way that they are used to accessing content. Yeah, I think that honestly, um, Barry, I feel like that was one of the most like resonated so much with me when we discussed this the other day, which was that um, just that that sense of like when we're designing content, like oh, this reads like a like a like a brief Guardian opinion piece, like it looks like that as as you scroll through it on your mobile phone, which is something that people will recognize and be comfortable in terms of like from the user's perspective and just understanding kind of how they navigate the online world really should kind of be the starting point for looking at what they might find comfortable in terms of the virtual experience too, which is, I think, so important. I don't think most, I don't think that's included in most of our needs assessments already. Um, no, I, I think there is a, there's a challenge with designing digital in that I think a lot of people don't have confidence in their content. I think what they have confidence in is the content when they deliver it. And it's a, it's a big thing to make that step of, of taking you away from the content or, you know, you're, you're designing something that someone will work on on their own, you know, far away and in the future. Um, that, that's a very different thing to design to you getting and having a conversation and reacting to people. And I think if you think about, you know, the, the people to look at, you know, don't go and look at online learning. If you want to get good at, at designing things that people will happily consume online. So particularly we're thinking content delivery, don't go and look at what learning designers are doing. Go and look at what journalists are doing. Go and look at what marketing people are doing, because people suck this stuff up in, you know, millions of megabytes of content every single day. People read huge amounts of online content. People watch huge amounts of video. Go look at what they're doing. Don't look at what learning designers do, because otherwise you'll just end up with e-learning content. And no one wants that. And, and I think as well, that's very true um, to say that it doesn't necessarily, you don't need to necessarily have that budget for marketing or whatever. But if you look at how that's approached, um, you can learn a lot, I think. And I think for, for our group, and if anybody, we've got just at five minutes left, if anybody has any questions, type it into the Q&A now, um, and, and we'll see if we can squeeze one or two more in. But I, I also wanted to just highlight, I think that probably for a lot of the people in this group, um, just that point of it's, it's, I think it's a leap of faith for us to actually detach ourselves from our content. We're so used to being the person who delivers it and to really kind of gauging the mood of the room and attitudes and perceptions and really kind of, but it, I think it's also a challenge for us and a, and a good, a healthy challenge to actually kind of, you know, put down our work, um, and, and allow it to speak for itself in some ways. So. I mean, I think that's that's one of the things that was interesting, you know, about this book in that this I mean, this book has Clive's name on it. But and, and you know, he's the author. He's he's the guy that, you know, did all the hard work of sitting down and writing this book. But when you think about this book, there was years, you know, probably decades of experience, years of practice and then 18 months of doggedly sitting down and producing this book. We don't get that kind of luxury with learning design, do we? I mean, I, I, no one's ever said to me, um, here's a learning problem. Can you, you know, pop back in a year and a half and deliver it? We're working on much tighter timescales where, you know, everything is incredibly condensed. So you're having to do the job of being like a journalist or, you know, a storyteller, an author, 
and trying to encapsulate all of your experience and experience that comes from workshops and everything and try and get that down into a format that people will happily consume and do that on crazy deadlines and with never with enough budget. So be kind to yourselves. <laughs> Thanks, Barry. I think we don't have any more questions, Erica, and I think we're just about at time. So I just popped up the, my contact details. If anyone wants to contact me, I will answer whatever questions or send them via Erica. Um, and last thing to close, um, this thing here is about the six characteristics of compelling content, which will be emailed out to you after. So it's an additional bonus, which is the bit that goes on after the jukebox. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Erica. No, that was great. Thank you so, so, so much, um, Barry and Jen, for your time, Barry, for your knowledge. It's really, really helpful for us all to be able to kind of understand the basics and what may seem as perhaps obvious or simple, sometimes just hearing it and having that light bulb go off in our heads is just like, oh, right, okay, this is a different way to approach this. So this is really helpful and we're really grateful for your time and your brilliance and Jen for getting all the questions together and having that conversation. Um, just to close off, to say thanks everyone so much for joining us today. Um, the session has been recorded, so we will be putting it online on our learning, learning center and you will receive an email if you've registered um, for that as well. We will follow up with these slides that Barry has used. And if you have any questions at all, do feel free to reach out to me. Um, I can be sure to include my email address as well in that email and we can uh, communicate those questions to Barry to be sure to get those out back your way. So thank you so much for your time and I hope you have a fabulous Friday and weekend ahead. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks so much, Barry. Thank you. Bye-bye.